by cultural hybridity factors to suit the purpose of the players. As can be seen in Central Java, uh, Banyumasan Salom called Bongkel has some instruments like the one in the traditional Salom Baraya from uh, West Java, as we can see in, um, in Central Java, there is the Talung Rantai, which is also the same for the Bandung people, also Talung Rantai for their uh, Talung Paraya. But then in Central Java, uh, they combine with uh, instruments which are usually in the gamelan. There's Sarung, Peking, Barung, Demung, Kendang, and the Gong and Kempul. Whereas in West Java, uh, the Talung has a number of uh, variants. In addition to Talung Rantai, there's Talung Jinjing, King King, and others, as you can see on the PPT. Now, with the one in Central Java, uh, it turns out that some of it is taken for the people who are playing in Malioboro. Malioboro is uh, a famous street in Yogyakarta, and they call themselves as the Funk Anklung group. Uh, they also make use of Talung King King but also Anklong thinking, and there's a drum set, you know, the drum like uh, in, in, in usual bands, and there's a bus drum tong. Bus drum tong is like um, this, uh, the blue bucket that I was telling you about uh, when uh, I saw this group in Semarang. And then they add to it a tambourine. Now this has developed into Semarang with the group called New Talong, and that's exactly what you saw on the picture when I gave you. They have Talong King King, Anglong King King, a drum set, bass drum set, and also tambourine. By comparison, the one in West Java, the traditional Talong Baraya, this uh, developed into what I will be uh, informing you about the Panglong in West Java. They have Talong Jinjing, Talong King King, Talong Panepas, uh, Talong. Uh, bongong and gronggong, angklong and kendang, as well as vocal. Vocal meaning uh, the person who will be singing. Okay, next slide. So, um, what is then pangklong? Okay, well, the person who made this terminology, his name is Abba. He claims that it stands for his talong group who likes to dress up and follow the DIY, the do-it-yourself ideology of the punks. The term punk itself, as said by, we've learned from Professor Jeremy Wallach um, uh, in his ethnomusicology article, he defines it as a cultural production devoted to punk music and culture that catalyzed the growth of local punk scenes in urban and semi-urban areas all around Indonesia in the last 10 years. Now, when he made the article, it was in 2008. So I believe you're talking about 1998, right, Prof? It's been some time since we saw each other. Uh, I did um, met uh, Prof. Jeremy Wallach in Bowling Green State University in Ohio. So it's really kind of like a reunion <laughs> by being here in the same webinar. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. So. Um, this this uh, punk clone, it uh, they say it, it, it has a 21st century punk characterized uh, by uh, Prof Wallach. He said they they are having mohawked hair and black leather clad fashion kind of anak punk or punk kids. Okay, so it, it's like a definition like whenever we see kids on the street with colored hair and it's mohawked or whenever they have this uh, leather black jacket on, and sometimes they would also have um, some chains, big chains uh, as a necklace, then we call them as punks. Now, using this characteristic, as you see on the picture, uh, when they're playing their talo and they're dressed up as, as punks, then uh, I also agree, okay, so this group can be called punk long. Okay, next please. Now, more info about this Panglong uh, community is that uh, it started with nine personnel. Uh, they've played their kind of punk music since 2000. 
But in its development, it turns into talong instrument to help preserve the Indonesian musical instrument. In this Panglong musical group, the community collaborates with the talong, in, uh, the talong instrument with kotrek, kandang, and trompet or the trumpet. Okay. Now, interestingly, the community which embraced street kids to, uh, to be organized and educated in playing the talong is acknowledged with many national certificates for its educated lyrics to street homeless punks. And an example of this is the lyric from their Belajar Persama Sama song, which I show you on the left side of, of my uh, PPT. Uh, Mr. Gilang MC, can you turn on the video clip just a little bit so we can hear the music that they have? The video? Okay, miss, wait a minute. Okay. I have played. Okay. Just go on to. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay, that's that's kind of enough, right? Thank you. We can go back to the uh, presentation. Okay, Miss. What should we do? Back to the presentation. Okay. Slide show. To the, right. next, so, to the next slide. Uh, still here. So uh, the lyric, uh, more or less, they say, Belajar bersama-sama, berkarya bersama-sama, kerja sama-sama, semua orang itu guru, alam raya sekolahku, sejak dalam bangsaku, sejak dalam hatiku, belajar bersama-sama, berkarya bersama-sama, kerja sama-sama. So, if we try to analyze these lyrics, it's not the conventional punk-like lyrics where they often uh, show their protests. But in here, uh, this community is actually uh, trying to educate the people who join their punk lung community and also the youngsters at large in Indonesia to become a people who is organized, to become people who would then uh, look into their education as becoming the most important of their means. So uh, for them uh, to make this punk community means uh, you can dress up as punks, but it's not for you to just become protesters without any uh, point into saying that, but you know, you, you show yourself that you are also a community which has education, which knows art, and one of those art is playing the talo. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so back to the street players. Um, I then decided to come back to these people and I did a small interview um, which perhaps uh, the audience here may also want to do the same because these uh, Taolong people or these people playing the Taolong or Angklong it's not only in Semarang but uh, there's also in Bandung, in Yogyakarta, at least in uh, Java alone these people are always playing on uh, a corner of the street and one of those, um, the one in Semarang, which I saw was, uh, it turns out that the big blue gentong or tong with cowhide leather covering on it was made on their own. And, but the angklong said they bought it. The gambang or the xylophone type of angklong is also bought and in addition to the small drum set. And I first thought that they probably go to some kind of training but they told me that no, they, they played it on their own. Uh, they, they are able to do it uh, autodidactically. And uh, they're, not real, they're not influenced at all by the West Java Stalong, but instead they were influenced by the Malioboro Angklong players uh, who often play Sampur Seri med medley. 
uh, these people play nonstop from 8 in the morning until 5 p.m. And they do it for a living. They do ask people to chip in money in their buckets. Uh, they used to have palms, but they have buckets now to make it simpler for people to chip in. And they could earn about 100,000 rupiah per day, per person. That's more or less uh, $10 US. So that's 300 rupiah for, this, for the three people. And so they are depending on it for their, their life subsistence. And um, they said they enjoy the, the opportunity that sometimes they receive invitations to play for a circumcision ritual. And then there was this police uh, colonel, he was inaugurated and he was, uh, they were asked to play in his inauguration. I asked them, uh, like, I mean, I thought by being street people, they would move around, right? But they said, no, they have no plans of moving to another place. And they have no plans at all to be under a certain group or association because they think that it welcomes trouble. Okay, so they are not like, what I thought uh, being into a, a group of of Panglongs or Talong. So this these people are on their own. So in conclusion, as uh, you can see in my last slide, conclusion, please. My uh, I know that. I should make further research to have a very qualified conclusion for you, but at least this initial interest uh, has been opening up my mind to dwell in deeper about this uncle group, especially in Semarang. And hopefully, I don't know how, but I should be able to uh, find ways and interview this Bangkulong community in Bandung. But um, at least, from this small research, I'm able to conclude now that traditional Indonesian angklung and talong has inspired young street people to be creative in playing the musical instruments. Uh, for me, as somebody who is not in their group, I appreciate them because it means that they help conserve the Indonesian uh, traditional music. And through cultural hybridity means, uh, West Java Bandung community, which established the punk one group and who are dressed up like punks, but sings educative lyrics while preserving Jalo musical instrument, yeah, is, is an interesting group that we should be researching on further. Now, through some modifications, the Java folks, Jalo and Anglong instrument, uh, according to me, is becoming a popular culture now. Although most players play at a street corner and gets money from those stopping at a traffic light, uh, it does not necessarily mean that they come from an organized group. Some are like the one that I saw in my Samarang community. Uh, they were inspired by the Malia Baro Angklong group. And yeah, with further research, uh, there may be a finding that maybe they are also inspired by the Banyumasan or Baraya Talo. Okay, that's my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Gilang. Okay, now, uh, thanks for listening to me since I am also the moderator. I would like to uh, invite the next speaker if I may, uh, Niputu Sri Dinari and Ali Faiz Ahmad Iman Nafal Oktavi Deta. Would you agree to present? And then we all have questions at the end or uh, would you prefer like for now, um, I presented and then there's a 10 minute question and answer and then I go to Niputu Sri Dinari or which way? Well, how would you like it to be? Can I hear from Niputu Sri Dinari and Ali Faiz? Ahmad, are you here? Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, so which do you yeah. prefer? Um, for me personally, I think it's better if we don't get distracted with other uh, uh, research, maybe. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. So how about you others? would like to present first? Uh, for a uh, question and answer first, and then uh, the next presenter. Oh, okay. Right. Well, yeah, I hope that uh, it also depends on you. I mean, okay. Uh, time, uh, Mr. MC, how much time do I have for my part? It's around like 15 minutes. Okay, yeah. there's still a good 15 minutes. All right. Yes. All right. 10 minutes. Um, if anyone would like to ask questions about my presentation, and then after that, we'll go on to uh, Miss Niputu. Yes, may I ask some question? Yes, please. I'm Ario from Jakarta, Ibu Ekawati. Uh, I'm just listening about uh, the Panklung, yeah? And yes. it's remind me about uh, flogging Molly. The soul, mm -hmm. the sing, and the lyrics like flogging Molly. Uh, and then uh, Panklung Pang itself is a community or a genre or a band. Well, they say it's a uh, it's the name of the community. They oh, call community. themselves Panklung. Yeah, actually, uh, to know about this Panklung group, it would be simple enough for you to just go on the YouTube. There yes. is already a Panklung documentary, and oh, in it, um, you'll see the person who established this group. They call him Abba, and um, he explains you know, why he made this group and um, you'll see the kinds of music that they are uh, making. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes, please. I have one. Oh, uh, okay. Hi, Prof. Hello, Boo. Uh, nice to see you here again. <laughs> Yes, sudah malam ini. Tengah malam. Terima kasih. So you you describe the people who play this music as street people, but yeah. um, how many are actually homeless, and how many people live on the street, uh, and how many are just uh, people looking for uh, income from busking? Well. Uh... My little research is only from this one group in Semarang, and the the small guy that I told you would who would go around and ask money uh, to people who stop by at the traffic light. I noticed yes. that actually uh, he he kind of changed jobs, changed jobs in a way that I used to see him as uh, the person who would be on a um, on the mini bus or mini call uh, mm -hmm. before the pandemic uh, lots of people would ride on this small mini bus and he would be the connect the person who uh, would uh, get the money from the people and give to the driver and so mm -hmm. it was interesting for me to see oh now he's he's in this group this uh talon group and the way uh that he is always in this group and they are always there from um eight to five, more or less, kind of, kind of time. It does not seem that they are the usual street homeless people. I mean, they, they're probably just people who don't know how to continue with their life and find money. And so they decided, uh, let's just play music like these people in Malioboro. And so, um, Mm -hmm. When I was searching for an answer of whether they are organized in a certain community, that's why they said, no, we just play on our own. Uh, we, we have our own way of making money. They have their own, um, what is it? They have their own budget first to buy things and then be there. But it's also interesting that they get to have the same place. So somehow maybe they got some kind of permission to be there and with their uh, information that they were invited by this uh, colonel, this police officer 
to be in his inauguration, mm -hmm. it probably means that they chip in somehow uh, for mm -hmm. to get to get a, a special place, and so they will not be shoved over or pushed over. So um, street people is still uh, in quotation marks. Uh, that's yeah. why I said this is a preliminary research. I mean, it it means that not everyone who are punk are always straight people and always uh, what is it homeless people. It's probably because of this pandemic. It's mm -hmm. their way of trying to survive their daily life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can suggest to me what next. What should I be doing next to uh, to further my my research? Yeah. Well, it's an interesting manifestation of, of the DIY philosophy, uh, mm -hmm. and it's it's not unusual. Um, if you look at uh, um, Leog, for example, um, there's someone writing a, um, a a paper on Leog in um, in West Java, which yeah. is uh, kind of like quarter uh and it, it's become uh, a kind of heavy metal uh, uh, mixture. You know, mm -hmm. various kinds of rock music have become mixed up with traditional music, uh, and have have at, at the sort of street level, and have become these sort of hybrid popular culture forms. And yeah. there's certainly a lot of research to be done there. Okay, so Did you hear you, any of that? The Rayok, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're saying that the Rayok can be comparable to this uh, Panglong community? Well, the people who do Rayok, some of them say that this is this is like heavy metal, or this ah, is like uh, Senyal, okay. like experimental. Uh, avant-garde music, noise music. Okay. Um, so they, they make the comparison, not me. Okay. Right, so I'll be... heavy metal and, and, and noise are have a sort of grassroots um, popular culture uh, presence that means that they are mixed up with traditional music too. Mm -hmm. And traditional culture. Okay, I'll be I'll be looking into that matter as well. Thank you. Sure. Okay, are there any other uh, questions or comments? But um, you agree, right? I mean, the term punk long. <laughs> And I thought, mm -hmm. hmm, punks, you know, I did, I did uh, assume that the kinds of lyrics that they have is really harsh and, you know, protesting about what the government is doing or what ordinary people are doing. But uh, seeing that lyric about Blaja Persama Sama, it's, it's making, you know, it's making me think that, well, maybe there are some good sides, you know, punks can be defined differently now, not like how it was in the 60s. Well, it, it's very important to look at marginal in Indonesia. Uh, marginal is a collective of punks who work with, with farmers and they are very nationalist, they're very Sukarnoist. And that, the song that they sang, um, Beljar bersama sama, or whatever it was, um, that could almost be a marginal song. So there's there, marginal songs are very positive, and they, they teach them to the anachalanan, and they play them on the ukuleles. And this is a, a punk group that's been around for over ten years. Uh, oh. I think they're they're based um, outside of Jakarta. I think in uh, okay. Depok, maybe. Um, but there's been some literature on them, on marginal. Right. Yes. Thanks so much. So Indonesian punk can be quite positive. 
positive? Yeah, quite, quite similar to the lyrics of that song. Okay. Radio, I will be taking up your suggestions and I hope you don't mind if I will communicate with you personally through your email. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thanks so much. Any other questions from the audience? Hello? Yes. So since nobody uh, asked questions, maybe I can uh, give some uh, comments on okay, your presentation. You, so I, I think it's a very wonderful um, presentation. And the I'm sorry, uh, it's the, your voice is rather breaking up. I done my uh, research on uh, Jakarta Punks and I following, mm -hmm. I follow one of the, the band called Bunga Hitam on a tour. Mm -hmm. okay. And then on a tour to uh, Mataram and also Bali, and then also Malang. And then when we go back to Jakarta, we decide to stop in Blora, mm -hmm. because we have friends there in Blora. And it's also interesting because our friends Coco in Blora at that mm -hmm. time have this. Coco? In uh, Blora. So punk, I mean, that's the basic things on, on punks, I guess. How they appropriate things and then they try to mix and try to, to hybridize, uh, uh, hybridize uh, things into their own uh, language. So, so, I, so I guess this is very interesting to see how the West uh, West Japanese uh, punk also uh, done the same thing, but my mm -hmm. my my initial question whether how do I put a name on it? Is it the punk or not? So one thing that I think is uh, what I call uh, post punk, what I call post punk reality. So I found out in Gloria at that time in two thousand six. Uh, I visited my friend Coco at the time, mm -hmm. and then Coco have a book called Post Punk. Mm. So when you read a book, also try to follow the term post punk as a reference, whether okay. uh, whether this kind of phenomenon can be uh, labelized as a post-punk reality. The other one I think is that we, we, we also have to seriously think whether maybe, maybe this is the shape of punk that we need right now. Because mm -hmm. right now, I mean, in the scene, in the punk scene, we only have like repetitions, you know, people playing uh, the same genre of punk music. Nobody, nobody, uh, there are not a lot of them that try to figure it out, a new form of artistic uh, intervention in the punk scene and then uh, figure out with a new form of music. And punk long, I guess, gives some uh, a fresh, uh, new era in the scene with the new kind of uh, subgenre in punk. We can call mm -hmm. this is maybe I, I don't know maybe 
local punk subgenre mm-hmm. or something. I mean, it, it is. Uh, I mean, it's going to be interesting if you're the one who put uh, some definitions or label. What kind of phenomenon it is? That's my comment. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. So um, somehow, so you're asking me to define the phenomenon of the of these new punk groups or post punk or <laughs> new punk genre. Yeah, that would be interesting. Thanks so much for your suggestion. And if uh, I am allowed, I would also like to discuss with you further through your email. Yeah. Yes. Maybe called ethnopunk. 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 <laughs> okay. okay. Ethnopunk from ethnography, is that right, Prof? Sure. Okay. Right. Well, um, Mr. NC, perhaps we can start with the next presenter. Is that okay? Yes, please. All right. Okay. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Ni Putu Sri Diniari to be ready yes, with hello. her PPT. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Yes. How hey, is my sound? Is you're fine. You're very audible. Okay, great. You can hear you. Yeah, great. Okay. Let me read okay. your bio data. Okay, please. Uh, okay, uh, you have informed us that you are born in Ubud, Bali, right? So the name Putu. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and from 2013 until 2015, Ms. Putu uh, has become a professor's assistant. Wow, at Pelita Harapan University, Karawati, majoring in visual communication design. Uh, on various occasions, she has actively supported student exhibitions as a co curator, both on and off campus in 2017. Uh, and Ms. Putu began to enter the fine arts scene in Bali through the collective Putu Wonder. Together with Putu Wonder, she organized and curated the exhibition of Masa Subur, uh, also in 2017, and at the Tanda Seru exhibition in 2019, Ms. Putu exhibited her first installation work in Respublika, a security mirror for genitalia. Since 2019, she has lived in Yogyakarta to continue her studies at the Graduate Program of Cultural Studies at Sanata Dharma University. She is currently working on her long-term project, Belok Kiri Jalan Seru, in her Instagram. I give yeah. to you, uh, audience, Ms. Ni Putu Sridi Nyari. You have around 20 minutes for your Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, uh, Ibu Ekawati, and also for the uh, organizers uh, for giving me a chance to present my uh, paper. Uh, I'll now share my screen. Um, so, this is a dual device. The first. Hello. Hello. Uh, is my uh, screen already shared? Yes. Yes, miss. Yes, you can see it. Okay, great. Uh, I'll start with the title. Obviously, it's uh, I chose the title "Spirituality and Colonial Imaginaries in Present Day Ubud: uh, Postcolonial Critique from the Eyes of a Balinese." So this is an island, the island, the, uh, sometimes regarded as even more popular than the nation itself, Indonesia. The image of Bali as a paradise began uh, with the Dutch colonial campaign to cover up the ferocious acquisition of the island of Bali in the early 19th century. 
since then, Bali has been described as an exotic place and cultural heritage of Hindu civilization, quite different from other islands in the Dutch East Indies. Since the 1920s, uh, several musicians, photographers, uh, filmmakers, uh, anthropologists, for example, here, I chose Walter Spies and Miguel Covaru Diaz. They uh, chose Ubud as a, um, a shelter standing point for uh, their uh, maybe run away from the West like that. Most of them uh, was attracted by its gentle society, mystical rituals, eroticized rare breasted woman that can they can use as an art object, intricate arts and other alluring features. So um, this is the Was Valley, the Champuan River in the west outskirts of Ubud. Uh, I was born and raised on the village underneath that, that photo there on the west, Anasanan village uh, in the early 90s and early on tourism became part of my upbringing. Um, I also brought up some archives from my family. One of the first one is on 1985 when one of the first tourists came to our village and then also, there's uh, 1991, during my three-month ceremony, tourists started to come. Uh, and then the 90s was part of a rapid growth in the tourism sector since the 1970s, following the policies of Suharto cultural tourism, or Pariwisata Budaya. Uh, this creates gentrification in my village. With their savings, painters started to build uh, tourist accommodations, farmers leave rice paddies and start to hold taxi signboards by the village intersection. And some even produce handicrafts for the escalating number of tourists whom we generally call everyone tamu. So in short, tourism creates um, this economic livelihood, uh, improves the economic livelihood for, of the villagers, of course, only to slow down during the monetary crisis in 98 and slightly after the 2002 Bali bombings and then recently because of the coronavirus epidemic. So before we start, I also uh, want to add another story. Um, this is from an encounter in late 2019. A long time repeater of our family's guest house had uh, asked me a question that has been elicited a number of times by a few old timers. And she is the typical uh, tourist that we get in our guest house, a former medical doctor turned holistic healer uh, coming from Europe. And she told me she finds Bali as an exhausting place because it is not the same anymore. For her, the current Bali has changed exponentially. People lose their roots along with the rapid development and it has become too hectic for her spiritual conquest. Well, uh, Dean McCannell argues that tourists power to look at and to colonize object reflecting a positive light back to the tourists. And Michelle Picard who has uh, written numerous times on uh, tourism in Bali argued that the native populations are not passive objects of the tourist gaze, but he argued they are actually active subjects who construct representations of their culture to attract tourists. Yet in recent years, spiritual tourists have dominated space and discourse on Eastern spirituality, often bringing with them internal assumptions, fantasies, and appropriation in practices of spirituality. The native populations become alienated in this new field, often dismissed as a result of how new knowledge is disseminated only inside the circles of the tourists, expats, and known commonly amongst the host uh, community now as not only Tamu, but we generalize like Tamu Yoga. Um, so uh, it brings up to my research questions. The first is how are the people of Ubud constructed through the discourse of Eastern spirituality and exoticism? 
And the second, what is the meaning of Eastern spiritualism worshiping and ex exoticizing for the people of Ubud? Uh, I chose a cultural studies perspective because so often uh, the general dominant narrative is tourist studies with a uh, research of objectives related to a uh, desire for conservation and authenticity. Uh, Elle McRae analyzed that despite some positives, the downside of this is the role of imperious ideas are mass and it paralyzes tourist decay. Um, in a one-sided narrative, Western identities are not encouraged to question their roles as gazers, invaders, or consumers. Rather than, than remains an insistent encourage to some pseudo socially just consciousness that tourism amplifies without the attendant concerns of post and neo colonialism. Placing this consciousness exclusively in empowered terms seem more important in tourism than the self affirmation and rendering of indigenous ideals and negotiations with this power. So uh, the, my objectives is um, I want to inspect the construct, uh, firstly, the contradictions, anomalies, and paradoxes of uh, spiritual uh, tourism. And also, I also give, want to give special attention to ways in which knowledge is disseminated and how values and meanings are negotiated, changed, and replaced. Uh, the aims of this writing um, is uh, to document, reflect, and analyze years of observation made on spiritual tourists in coming to Ubud. Secondly, to fill the gap in post-colonial studies related to Ubud in general. Therefore, this research is meant to be used as an alternative reading, less dependent on the conceptual toolkit of existing research especially the dominant reading of tourist studies, and in so doing, make a critical contribution to interdisciplinary knowledge and the local community of Ubud. Uh, venturing for, further on this research uh, project, I comprehend how tourism has become a breath of life or access in the lives of millions of Balinese. Uh, Al McRae suggested cultural studies could present an opportunity to move beyond the conventional binarized dialogue with colonial, colonization and capitalist consciousness previously punctuating the scholarship. She also suggests that multiple literacies offer, offering many potential readings and mappings enables a birth of socially conscious politics and stretches the practice of tourism beyond traditional models of empowered tourists or disempowered hosts. Uh, I also use a ther theoretical framework from the late um, Edward Said in True Orientalism. Uh, it helps to give us perspective on the ambiguous meetings between the host and tourists full of junctures, uncertainty, and hesitation. Uh, I will use the reading of Bartholomew's uh, 98 because she focused on uh, spirituality, Eastern spirituality appropriation in the West and traces Orientalism to Neo-Orientalism uh, with a histor historiographic and contemporary lens. Uh, I use a couple of uh, theoretical framework um, to read this uh, research. Another uh, is from the work of Homi Baba that I will use to support with the notion of ambivalence or anxiety and hybridity. Uh, through David Hutter, he reads, uh, he shows us how ambivalence provides space for counter knowledge and strategies of resistance and contestation. He shows us uh, these effects are apparently unconscious, but at the same time might become strategies of resistance to work alongside more direct and explicit action. 
uh, there is uh, Baba also suggests like uh, anxiety creates mimicry, which implicitly offers an opening for agency and even a model for agency. Um, this is me explaining that uh, alongside ambivalence and mimicry, hybridity is another concept of Baba uh, that I insist on using. Um, I will just skip that one. Okay, the methods. So uh, I use a lot of um, studies from the lived experience to describe the experience of the subject involved with spiritual tourism. Uh, and also an, in, another inspiration is McRae. Uh, he suggests uh, a methodological digression in reading uh, about Balinese culture through spatial zones, temporal processes, and modes of action or perception. But when I read his research, I found out uh, it has a lot of similarities with the Balinese concept of uh, desa, which is space, Kala, which is time and patra situation or action. So uh, each phenomenon is read in a in a shift of perceptions to analyze the phenomenon, which is crucial in exploring multi layers of issues involved, external or internal, the present, past or future, and its placements in context. And my main interview is in November 2020 with uh, Markandeya Yoga Indonesia School founder, Guru Madi Sumantra. And then um, uh, I acknowledge that uh, my ethnographic and social capital built up ever since I was raised in a house church guest house uh, frequented by Tamu Yoga has helped me a lot in compiling and collecting data. Some are recollections of encounters and conversations I have with these people. And I eventually contacted a few of them and got recommendations to numerous online forums, events, and social media outlets, uh, which I frequented to document and monitor the discourses. Uh, and also some of their events that I try to participate in. So uh, next is the results and discussion. Um, if we talk about uh, Eastern identity from the Orientalism to Neo-Orientalism, uh, we can see from Bartholomew's research how she uh, demonstrates that in her studies uh, of academics, uh, spirituality, music, ideas about sexuality and therapy, Orientalists imagine the similarities between the East and West, regardless of religious significance of what is being absorbed. Uh, she is uh, interested in forms of adaptation of other aspects of culture and how uh, the West sometimes appropriates it. So, um, Uh, I would like to insert a story about this uh, photo. Uh, it's another classic case that I often found uh, during my work because uh, I have done some freelance work for uh, hotels uh, and tour companies. Sometimes I do design, sometimes I do what you call uh, I become a tour guide at one point. So this is another story about this guy. <laughs> I hide his face. So uh, an American middle-aged man, he just came back from the yoga capital of the world in Rishikesh, India. He insists on calling himself Wayan, one of the names of the first born child in the Balinese naming system. I chatted with him on general subjects like tourist sites, and recommended uh, restaurants. He seems really compassionate uh, and gentle. His hands claps at the chest so often that I felt like a royal. 
And as soon as the topic gets too spiritual, it gets it's disturbing because he talks about Hindu teachings he learned in India and mentioned he wanting to be a Hindu priest in Bali, combining what he had learned in India. Uh, I told him I'm amused because Balinese Hindu is not just a, a direct copy of Indian Hindu. He continued to say that eventually everything is universal and connected. There seems no space for me to tell my story. And yet again, I am in this situation, avoiding conflict for the sake of a full monthly payment that he was going to transfer. So um, the image, this image of Bali, ex exoticism of Bali, uh, calls people living in elegant material simplicity, a kind of exotic voluntary poverty because their real concern is for finer things in life, such as art and divinity than talking about money. The implication is that until now with a larger agency, this romanticism is legitimized by the community, the government, as well as visiting tourists or foreigners live, living in Bali. Bali did experience a downturn after the Bali bombings. But uh, these events that I show here shows how quickly it bounced back. The, uh, the birth of new festivals like Bali Spirit, Modern Woman Festival. There's also Bali Vegan Festival, Bali Meditation Festival. And also uh, this is, um, you have to, uh, acknowledge this a movie also um, starring the 90s highest paid actress Julia Roberts uh, took place in my hometown in Ubud. Um, personally, I think the movie has created a certain fantasy uh, of Ubud even more than the people of Ubud can comprehend. I mean, uh, Ubud is imagined as a spiritual center, a place to find intuitive healers to heal their past wounds or simply predict their future love life. Um, I've noticed since uh, after maybe 2010, there was a sharp increase in middle-aged women who traveled to Ubud intending to seek inner peace, spending their days in detox programs, looking for shamans and other spiritual endeavors. So uh, I will take you to Ubud with this community board. It shows uh, the increase in lifestyle migration, spiritual uh, tourism. There's new sub communities uh, forming everywhere in Ubud. Um, you can see from the posters, the shamanic Reiki level, Friday Kirtan dance, cacao workshop, jam workshop, Bali indigenous stone festival, things like this are, became my interest in how they intersect with one another, especially how the locals will, uh, uh, what you call, meet and greet this new phenomenon. Um, this is one of the interesting uh, findings in my case study. My interview with Guru Madhya Sumantra uh, took me to Markandeya Yoga School. Uh, actually, I knew him since elementary school because he was um, my friend's father, but I was surprised he suddenly become a spiritual guru and then um, create yoga uh, teacher trainings and so on. And what you call, he teaches uh, methods in a proprietary style of yoga and healing. Uh, he claims that it is 100% Balinese, but from my research, he derives inspiration from Ayurveda, from uh, a bit of Hatha yoga and so on. But yeah, uh, his main goal is to uh, he said, preserve Balinese uh, authenticity, Balinese culture. Um, and this is him 
offering yoga teacher training and Balinese healing packages. Uh, one uh, interesting research I found about uh, this uh, related to this is Aryadi Putra. He found that spiritual teachings, uh, especially of Kandapat. Kandapat is like the four brothers that we believe. Maybe I, I've heard there is in Java also four brothers that protect us. Uh, Kandapat and other traditional medical systems are commodified into increasingly trendy local wisdom-based tourism products. Interestingly, a new phenomenon emerged where the situation pushes traditional spiritual and medical practitioners to enter the modern power structure. Aryadi Putra also highlights the inherent image of Balinese spirituality has been mobilized, negotiated, and made an instrument for material interest. The implication of this commodification is strengthening local knowledge and a conscious positioning of practitioners as professionals in the spiritual tourism field. Uh, these are some of the more famous uh, healer and priest that I wasn't able to be in contact with because uh, like Ketut Arsana, the one on the left corner, uh, People took like sometimes four or five months to to have themselves healed by him, and there's also several others uh, healer who are shown in this picture. Most of them have uh, a proper management. Most of them have uh, websites, and even some like Ratu Bagus on the upper right corner. Uh, he has communities like small all around the world, uh, in the Netherlands, Russia, um, in the US, and then uh, they create like small community that um, does his style of yoga together. So um, the conclusion, the construction of spiritual imaginaries and meaning even to Eastern spirituality Spirituality, in this case focusing on Ubud, has made uh, the locals rediscover and contest traditional practices. Uh, the, this rise of spiritual tourism become an impetus for the Balinese practitioners to renegotiate their identity. Baba believes this is a result of a split in personality, anxiety, or ambivalence. To give agency to the colonized, anxiety creates mimicry. Uh, accepting hybridity and cultivating it consciously is more difficult than finding and creating an identity that seems complete and clear or authentic and native. But nativism becomes a trap through the construction of its essentialist identity. It is important to not only celebrate hybridity as so often happens in contemporary culture, the hybrid identity of all of us does not eliminate power relations. So what must be sought and developed is a form of resistance, which questions and challenges power relations, especially exploitation involving neo-imperialist and neo-colonialist agendas. Uh, some notes about the use of all Western native populations, host communities, locals, and then the second uh, is this research is the beginning of a longer term research subject to a larger scope. So uh, I appreciate criticism and suggestions from various perspectives. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Ms. Kutu. You're exact You're on your time. 20 minutes. Yay. I invite questions from yeah. the audience. Would anyone like to ask questions? Either Hi. through the chat or speak up? Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Hi, this Hi. is yes. Hi, uh, hi, this is Elke speaking. Um, thank you for a very interesting uh, um, 
obviously you are a, you are a local and 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 the way you present your what's going on is has two sides right there's a there's a positive side to a rediscovering of the you know of your of the own identity but also there's a there's a there's a dark side to this as well uh, in terms of almost a you call it a neo-colonization, but then in a, a quite hybridized form and a, a kind of watered down form of, of the local culture. Do you think in the long run, because I mean, if I listen to friends and people I know, uh, I live in Hong Kong, so a lot of people go to Bali from here for all sorts of purposes, right? But, but definitely for yoga, for healings, for it really is a bit, um it's very trendy to do that as well so a bit of a lifestyle thing going on. do you think in the long run this is harmful to the balinese culture and identity or can you see how this can continue to bring some positivity and some you know reconnecting with the with the balinese identity for locals or do you think it's a rather harmful uh, uh, long-term uh, mecha mechanism Okay. Hi, Elka. Thank you for your question. Uh, Ekawati, should I answer Elka first or wait for another question? Perhaps uh, you can just directly answer. Okay. So uh, if I can repeat, you were um, asking about the long-term uh, effects of these uh, spiritual tourism, if I may say, uh, and lifestyle migration. Did you, sorry, did you ask about that or only about the spiritual tourism? No, I just call it lifestyle tourism. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I for see. a lot of people, I... that's what it is uh, as well, I think. So it's just, a, a, yeah, it's not an official term. It's a term I use. Sorry, my microphone. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. We can hear you. Hello? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. I will put down my. Yeah. Um, we have to uh, look at this uh, in the long run, of course, because I can't imagine Bali not having the tourism side like that. The impact, of course, is multi-dimensional and of course often paradoxical like that and like the the what you call like what my research has so shown some of the Balinese uh, felt the need to reclaim their authenticity uh, with the rise of uh, what you call this uh, spiritual spiritual tourism so they they use tourism as uh, to to light up their inner fire. Like, uh, oh, we have a spiritualism, and we can ex uh, commodify it, like uh, move the sacred into the profane, and then um, make it available for everyone. So what I realize is more people now have access to uh, the healing methods, also. Uh, because in the past, it's it was really sacred. Only certain like priests can have access for that. So that's one of the positive note maybe uh, I can see from now. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you for an interesting question and also interesting answer. Any other questions for Ms. Kutu? Uh, yes, uh, if uh, I am, okay. uh, I would like to thank uh, the presenter for her presentation. I have a question about music in Bali. Traditionally, in Bali, gamelan music is faster than gamelan on Java. And do Balinese punk bands also play faster than Japanese ones?
Ms. Butu, would you like to answer uh, that question? Uh, I think that goes beyond my uh, scope of expertise. Uh, as I don't come from a music background and I'm afraid if my observations are wrong. <laughs> okay. Well, perhaps I can uh, chip in a little bit of the answer. Uh, right, that the gamelan music in Bali is played much faster. They have a more upbeat style kind of music in comparison to the Java uh, gamelan. And if you're interested into this, um, I have a friend. It's also a friend of Prof. Jeremy Wallach. Um, yeah, I, I can possibly give you an email uh, yeah. from David Harnish. Uh, he is he is based in California, but he is the expert for Balinese gamelan. Okay, so perhaps you can contact him further. Yes, okay. please. Uh, yes, uh, give the email address. Yeah. Right, you're welcome. One more question for Ms. Putu from anyone here in the audience? No more? We can possibly go to the next presenter, but in any case, if there are still questions, uh, Sometimes questions do not come right away, but before we finish, maybe you like, oh, I forgot to ask this question. Please go ahead and uh, put it in the chat. Can I uh, have the next presenter? Alifais Ahmad Nawfa Are you here yet? Would you like to start and share your screen? Okay. A little introduction from Ali Faiz. Uh, he's a postgraduate student in cultural studies. So another cultural studies will be expert. Uh, she is an alumni from uh, the English Literature of Islamic State University in Jakarta, who has an anarchism topic for her bachelor thesis. Let's welcome Ms. Ali Faiz. Go ahead and present your slide. Hello, uh, my presentation is uh, entitled Against the Power of Empire by Politics Between New York and Jakarta Graphic. Uh, between New York and Jakarta Graffiti Writer in Sticker Culture Slap, Sticker Slap Culture. Hmm. Hello, sir. We can't hear you, hear your voice, sir. Uh, test, check, check. Okay, we fine. Yes. Uh, this uh, the abstract of this uh, research. Uh, the abstract of this research uh, is about uh, Havox. Uh, it's about uh, the background of this uh, research is uh, United States Postal Service, as uh, we seen in the beginning of the slides. Uh, that's uh, May uh, about to collapse in 2016 until now. And then uh, the soon uh, the this state owned um, companies uh, soon may be capitalized uh, as uh, the state owned corporation uh, who provide priority mail shipping labels that available for free in US their citizen and used by graffiti writers in order to create marks in sticker slab culture. 
uh, gravity is a form of the consequences of the symptoms of globalization and make it a global phenomenon, especially in the urban landscape as a contestation movement from civil society to dialogue indirectly with the landlord and several capitalists against uh, agents through cultural channels. Graffiti can be said to be no longer just a subculture, but on a most occasion as a counterculture movement because of its concrete efforts against privatization and commercialization of public facilities. Uh, graffiti has a number of basic styles at its forms, uh, as it seems on the slides there are text, throw-ups, blockbuster walls, styles, and pieces. And uh, over time, the forms of graffiti have developed in forms in other, in other forms such as stickers, poster, web page, or uh, and the latest uh, forms is sculpture as uh, in several weeks ago we can see uh, some monuments in desert in United States uh, and it can be stated as a part of vandalism although uh, there, there are some issues that the installation that monuments it uh, produced by extra extraterritorial things uh, and then the emergence of graffiti can be traced to its existence in late 60s in Philadelphia and New York. Starting from the manifestation of embracement in a geospatial context from several developments in basic forms of this manifestation, the contestation on the agent of this peripheral art actors is divided between graffiti writer and graffiti artist. Uh, there is a fairly thin distinction between Graffiti and street art is uh, motifs. Uh, it will be discussed later. Uh, here, uh, graffiti and graffiti versus street art. Uh, the, uh, as I stated before, uh, there are several um, distinction between graffiti and street art. Uh, uh, graffiti has a uh, more purely vandalistic or uh, uh, having destructive motives and can be said to be far, further away from having democratic motives and personal. Um, maybe uh, we can trace uh, graffiti movement to uh, Dadaism in 90 and, and early World War, First World War and Second World War and, and then uh, the development uh, that there can be Mm, it spread to street art from graffiti a street art uh, having several elements from graffiti and it can be said to be more explicit in conveying message and giving access to the presence of meaning for society such as political slogans and symbolic uh, image uh, i can give you uh, several example like in uk and us in the agents of the uh, agents from graffiti scenes there are King Robo and and Bengsi in from US and and there are from uh, the graffiti agents from Indonesia there are Senseva and there are Darbots uh, and then uh, here some um, um, uh, the scenes uh, state this uh, fight as a uh, beef. Uh, there are a uh, on the left. Uh, there are a uh, beef between King Robo and uh, Bengsi in early nineties, and it's happened until on early uh, in decades on, on early two thousands, and then and at the bottom there are uh, beef between Senseva with Darbots in Jakarta. And then and next, as uh, I said before, uh, uh, the, uh, the distinctions between graffiti and street arts, uh, the, as I said before, uh, the graffiti uh, morely uh, personas instead of uh, 
they have uh, some gap between their piece with an uh, aesthetic uh, manual street art uh, can be dependently to aesthetic as uh, uh, is it previous uh, it's in previously uh, there are there are hairs on the top uh, there are there are both street art street artists uh, move uh, street artists who endorsed by BMW as we know this since was built uh, originally or puritanly uh, uh, having gap from uh, capitalistic things and then and on the boat uh, on the, uh, the graphic on the bottom uh, there are uh, DHL sticker pack which has endured several uh, street artists and then uh, here uh, sticker straps we as uh, 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 now we know uh, we will talk about the sticker straps. Sticker straps began to use by New York and Los Angeles graffiti writers since uh, circa mid of 60s. Uh, and this wasn't too far from the birth of graffiti and street artists itself. And uh, uh, on early, uh, they, uh, they are using USPS uh, sticker 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 pack uh, sticker slaps themselves are, are part of graffiti uh, that make it easier for graffiti writers to write their work in advance and speed up times when they act beside graffiti writers the sentence is also agreed by detectives from West Valley City in, from Utah it, uh, as they state, uh, sticker slaps began to use by New York and Los Angeles graffiti writers since mid 60s. Uh, generally, stickers used uh, because the stickers uh, can be obtained freely and free of charge from shipping service providers, uh, United States Postal Service, which has characteristic of easily absorbing various types of inks has durability from temperature and humidity and is also difficult to remove as part of the public service uh, which is provided by the states and accessible for free usps priority mail stickers have been popular among graffiti writers since the beginning of the sticker slap culture to date uh, the use of stick Sticker priority mail that is not for shipping as well as vandalism related to USPS mailbox is illegal with fines ranging from uh, $5,000 to $20,000 US dollar and imprisonment up to three years in prison for each action. Uh, in its development, priority mail label began to penetrate into other scenes such as street art, uh, punk and pop as reported by Washington DC uh, nearly 50% of sticker slaps user are women uh, this provides that every since that uses the sticker slaps method involves women by equal portion when such subculture stereotypes are predominantly male most of the distribution of the sticker slaps is in government buildings large corporation and elite class residences and some are containing subversive organs and image. Uh, in the stick, sticker slaps culture, uh, there is a kind of norm circulating among the activists of the scenes. Uh, in street art, for example, street artists generally exchange each other by sending the works that has been on a sticker. Uh, it also happens uh, for graffiti writers. Uh, in the 90s, since the internet began to be touched by public at large uh, and the presence of blogs, sticker slaps, actors began to display stickers that they got from exchange. But sticker exchange was not necessarily that easy to do. Sometimes a number of sticker slaps actors from graffiti writers or 
street artists whose image is enlarged in their respect, respective scenes are difficult to reach and exchange for. For example, Instagram through its hashtag and account post features make a mini gallery of throw ups, tags, and maybe one style from a number of graffiti writers on the hashtags. Hashtags priority mail seekers. Uh, and then as an uh, underground movement, uh, of course not all of them are present on account or in the internet. A large number of actors maintains values that they consider staying organic and distance themselves from digitalization. The organic values referred to, of course, are referring to as, uh, how graffiti keep their idealism and keeping the subjects distance from what is it said to be art. Uh, and or as well as the capitalization of things they have done. The distribution and exchange of principle of trust, which is micro, uh, negates the accumulation of capital and of course has ideologically principles as stated in the, as it says before. Uh, I do believe uh, uh, this can be traced to the philosophical concept of Antonio Negri and Michael Hart, uh, biopolitics, uh, political philosophy concept, as well as an alternatively, alternative economy based on values that are having some, uh, having, uh, some gaps uh, from capitalism and attempts to revisit the values of locality of the perpetrators of against or against. Uh, Excuse me, you have five minutes left. Okay. Uh, here, uh, uh, there's a, uh, I try to tracing the um, relations between graffiti writers from New York and Jakarta using uh, biopolitics, the empire of biopower. This is a concept from Antonio Negri and Michael Hart. Uh, the empire, the ability to disseminate and realize social relationships, the multitude as a living political body that does not just submit to the network system of orders, rewards, and punishment, uh, as it says in the Empire 2000 by Negri and Hart. Uh, Negri and Hart have also having uh, um, terms of biopolitics as the ability to produce social relation or life itself through interactive and co cooperative networks in the social, political, cultural, and economic spheres that lives cannot be subdued under the rule of capital, let alone form in accordance with the control and expectation of the empire or internal resistance. Uh, the empire itself uh, is a hier hier hierarchical community control system that has internalized subjects in individual and collective consciousness, for example, loves and uh, of course things like this can internalize, internalize their targets with guarantees of control and society. And then the next concept is the multitude small group that has basically has uh, been alienated not only from their worlds but also from society. Collectivity cannot be reduced under the banner of citizen or class classification such as a working class uh, in a total empire sovereignty, citizenship or working class identity according to Megri, the supposed uniformity of self-identity as an organic part of concrete interest in capital accumulation. Uh, the focus of this research is a distribution of plain USPS priority mail seekers in Indonesia. Stickers used far from their destination can be distributed across the oceans. Uh, this qualitative research used the interview method with the main distributor in Indonesia as well as a graffiti writer whose name can be said um, as uh, the notoriety uh, from this graffiti scenes for at least uh, 20, 20 years. This research will, not also, will also not provide an identity related to the source based on the agreement between the researchers and the source. Uh, this research also does not discuss the detailed technical issues regarding the distribution of the priority mail sticker. Priority mail sticker. Uh, this research has been ongoing since August, 1st August 2020 with an intense approach between the researchers and the interviewee and his crew until 13 November 2020.
Okay, then... can you please conclude your presentation? Hmm. Okay, the conclusion the the and the conclusion of this um, this is, is uh, how the social compromise with the empire or capitalism or maybe the states as the as it seems by uh, graffiti from uh, graffiti writers between New York and Jakarta as, uh, as uh, it's the refusal to compromise uh, and consistently by this writer which has made by many parts of other multitudes forced to pound their fate still has a long way to go from the under of the girl and behind ghetto's shadow at a time when most of capitalism's crew being the time space and anonymity between them is no longer that a chance and i'm sorry i can um, i can't uh, explain more about the between the relations but maybe that's all thank you okay that concludes uh, the presentation from Faiz. Uh, do we still have time for at least one question? Hilang? Yes, miss. Take your time. Okay. Right. So uh, one or two questions for this talk about graffiti. Would anyone like to ask? Or I give back to Ali Faiz. Maybe you have something that can be uh, emphasized once more, and so we can have a better grip of your presentation. Uh, I do want uh, uh, to say that uh, graffiti endures the use, value of space, the leaf involvement, and quality of collective or communal life. And as a graffiti as a practice represent and make special social by active engagement and intervention with and in the urban environment it does so by challenging the right to colonize space and leave signs symbols message image traces life that are not driven not only by and for the market but by and for those who inhibited uh, inhibit urban space and this make makes communities and neighborhood uh, this is i want to tell about uh, the purity uh, the purity or puritanity uh, from uh, graffiti scenes and how it's dialogues to street arts which has been uh, manifested or uh, trying to approach it by uh, capitals, but then the graffiti itself, uh, graffiti sense itself having uh, some um, cope, how to resist, how to resist uh, as they using some illegal stuff to trade uh, and, or maybe uh, I can tell, is it about uh, for to live as a as a commodition, the sticker itself and how this is uh, can be said as an illeg illegal um, properties and misusing public service like priority stickers can be also can be interpreted as a criminal act of course when it view from a left perspective because USPS is a company funded by tax through the state however this does not rule out employment for creative groups, especially graffiti writers in New York and also any other writers in the world, such from Jakarta. Illegally, the okay. priority mail seekers is distributed. Uh, okay. Right. Hmm. Yes, thank you. Nice question. Very interesting. Um, unfortunately, we run out of time. So we, we run out of time, yes. Yeah, in this session, we learn about okay. Fangklong. We also learn about uh, how the Ubud people are nowadays presented with their spirit 
spirituality and colonial imaginaries, as well as uh, the graffiti art that um, Ali Fais was just uh, telling us. Okay, well, we learn a lot about uh, cultural studies and how it is related to punk culture. Thank you very much for being a great audience. I return the time to uh, Kak Tilang as our MC. Thank you. So thank you very much to Mrs. Ekawati, Mrs. Iputu Sridiniari, and Mr. Ali Faiz Ahmad for the presentation. So to, to all of the audiences, please go back to the main room because we are going to enter another quiz session and we are going to see the performances by Cryptical Death and Faith Runner. So to the, all of the audiences, please go back to the main room right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Gimana sih? Safe chat sih. Ini udah. But in the end is right I hope you had the time of your life But in the end, that's right. I hope you had the time of your life. It's something unpredictable. But in the end, that's right. I hope you had the time of your life. To come through. I'm sorry to inform you of the news. On your own, you'll stand in line and wait to let them pick your poison and then decide your fate. Standing on lines that you never want to cross. Better listen to the boss. I know you're lonely. I'm sleeping between trucks thinking of you Overwhelmed, what do we really know? We never had to live out on the road In the next five years I'm gonna get the less we see the beauty, the more we see this mess. In your room, you see a painting on the wall, but you don't see me at all. I know you're lonely too. I'm sleeping between trucks thinking of you. I know you're lonely too. Sleep in between trucks thinking of you
Hello everyone, welcome back to our meeting. First of all, I would like to say hello to all the people in Iberia, in Brazil, Colombia, Como Estas, USA, Australia, UK, Scotland, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Netherlands, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, and any other countries all over the world. So right now we are going to enter another quiz session. So be ready and prepare yourself. I would like to give you another question and you need to answer this question. If you know the answer, just type it on the back. The fastest person who answered the question correct will get, will get this. Free topic from us. So be ready. And here is the question. Okay, I hate to look into those eyes, eyes and see an ounce of What is the song of the light about? Okay, now it's the time to answer the question. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Guys? Hello. Oh, sweet child of mine, yeah. Okay. Congratulations. Two minutes, you, got you got this? Three gifts from us. Congratulations. Once again, congratulations. Okay, to the next question. Okay, wait a minute. Okay. Listen to this song carefully. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> Okay, once again, listen carefully. <laughs> okay, we have we here. Quiz. Wait a minute. Okay, congratulations to Mr. Congratulations once again to all the winners. Please contact us. Yes, Once again, contact us. Okay, we will have the last the last quiz session in the next breakout session. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, right now we are in the break session. In this session, we are going to see the performances by Critic of that and Great Run. So, the Green Day performances, you guys can go to the toilet, have a meal, and do anything what you want. Yes. And make sure you have a great day with us. Okay, after the performances, we are going to enter the last panel session. Okay, in the breakout room A, we have Mr. Bakalabi as the moderator. Okay, the title in breakout A is Movements in Top Culture. Okay, the title of panel session in breakout room B is Hung, Ben, and Now, led by Miss Elke as the moderator. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, don't forget to rename your ID Zoom according to which room do you want to get in. Okay, like, gentlemen, please welcome. And
this one called Revikasi.
Uh, this is our four songs. It's called The Mirror Reflect the Sound.
Dimana kalah Masih lari itu Apa kerjakan mereka Siang malam gak ada henti Dimana kalah Saya sayang itu Kau biarkan mereka Pikul sama beban berat itu Jangan, jangan kegunakan mereka Kau rambut semua itu dari hidupnya Bila kata canda ada tawa itu Lagi luar Selamat uh, siang waktu Indonesia. Uh, kami Faith Runner dari Pondok Gede Bekasi. Ya, selamat datang di acara Global Punk, Punk Scholars Network Seven Annual Conference and Postgraduate Symposium. Oke, okay, my friend. <laughs> Mancing mania mantap nih. Ya nih. Ini kita lagi di Symposium, my friend. Iya <laughs> kali. Yo Simposium ini. Itu kayak berasa seminar gitu tapi. Yo iya. Iya. Cuman ini. Ada webinar gitu, ada selingannya ngeband gitu. Karena ini biasanya yang rambutnya kayak gua nih kalau kayak gini nih. <laughs> Belajarnya terlalu keras nih. Belajar. Iya yeah, iya yeah, kayak gitu. Cuman biasa doi. Tetap jiwanya ngepang my friend. Oke <laughs> oke. Okay, okay. uh, yang belum tahu uh, kami ini siapa? Kami Fate Runner. Di belakang itu ada Panji. ya. Yeah. Panji di belakang. Uh, ada Kikis. Lalu hari ini kami spesial membawa teman kami. Uh, Aldino dari Depu. Ya. Yeah. Ada spin five years, vakum ngeband, <laughs> vakum ngeband dia. Baru hari ini diajak lagi dia. Mantap, ya kan? Oke, okay, uh, mau langsung kita singkat lagu kedua nih, my friend. Apa gimana? Oke okay, ya. Oke, okay, kalau gitu uh, for the second song, it's called Di Mana Tenang, uh, taken from our very first uh, mini album in 2013. We believe we make it.
Kalau di mana tenang, taken from our very first uh, mini album uh, in 2013 called We Believe We Make It. Oke, okay, once again, thank you buat High Face uh, for the place, the cozy place. Oke, okay, tepuk tangan dong buat High Face. Nah, dan pastinya juga buat uh, rekan-rekan yang bekerja untuk Global Pang ini, ada Pang Scholars Network 7 Annual Conference and Postgraduate Symposium. Sekali lagi tepuk tangan buat PSN. Woo! Belum. Tepuk tangan lagi buat para band-band yang mengisi di acara ini. Woo! Ada Next Week Team, ada SoftX, ada Human Animal, nanti sore ada Somagora. Banyak pokoknya my friend. Pokoknya nih. Eh lu jangan ngeliatin gue, emang gue pelawaknya. <laughs> emang gue pelawaknya apa my friend. Ha? Oke nih, waduh, waduh. Uh, special thanks juga buat Mr. Fakran. Fakran Ramadan. Ya, gitu. Ya. Uh, Dalam bahasa itu dia suka dipanggilnya Fukrun. In bahasa called Fukrun. Ya. Dosen yang uh, cukup berdedikasi di bidang pendidikan dan juga di bidang skenanya. Ya, skenanya itu apa dia? Skena pangrok dia? Enggak, enggak lah. Pop dia, pop. Ya. Eh ngomong, masa gua doang? Mal- <laughs> <laughs> iya loh, begini doang nih. Ini jadinya Stefan Runner, bukan Fred Runner. <laughs> Emang gitu. Oh gitu Waduh lo kacau semua lo. Nih rambut gue botak gara-gara lo ini. Aduh, aduh. Kacau nih, oke. Okay. Uh, sekali lagi, uh, kami Faith Runner dari Pondok Gede Bekasi. Uh, untuk uh, promosi, promosi boleh kan my friend? Uh, untuk akun IG kami bisa dicek di Faith Runner uh, 2010, Faith Runner 2010, Faith Runner 2010. Uh, lalu untuk, uh, itu IG kan? Uh, YouTube ya, yeah, Fate Runner Band, Fate Runner Band untuk YouTube itu. Oke nih, mantap nih. Kita ngobrol apa lagi nih? Panji, lu jangan diem aja, lu jauh, terjauh kan? Mau ngobrol nggak? Ini kesempatan sekali ini. Oh, ini kelas itu. <laughs> Oke, okay. kali ini dia lucu. Oke okay, ya, nggak apa-apa. Kita pertahankan dia. <laughs> Kita pertahankan dia. Kali ini dia lucu. <laughs> Aa, gimana? <laughs> nah, dia uh, lima tahun aku ngeband, jadi baru hari ini dia uh, ngeband lagi nih. Ini mau langsung singkat lagu tiga atau gimana nih? Ntar kalau singkat lagu tiga ada lagu keempat, ah bingung nanti. Belum belajar soalnya nih. <laughs> yeah. Oke okay nih, uh, sekali lagi uh, thank you buat High Space, buat tempatnya yang cozy. Uh, lalu buat teman-teman juga yang bekerja di dalam PSN. ya uh, Untuk IG-nya uh, PSN Network ya. PSN underscore Network Indonesia. 15. <laughs> Apa gue lihat HP dulu nih, nih, nih. nggak ada skripnya nih. Ini sebenarnya bagian ini dipotong nanti sih. Cuman pas main band aja kita, kita ngobrol. Iya, udah tahu cuman puas-puasin aja. Puas-puasin aja gitu kan. Iya, namanya band jarang manggung ya begini banyak bacot jadinya. Ya kan kalau personilnya ada yang ngurusin burger, ada yang ngurusin 
Ajar boleh. Oke deh. Ajar deh. Ah, kalau sarkastik. Rawe tuh ini. We are a human, but we are inhuman. We don't like each other, but we harm each other. We don't have a brain, that's what just is said. That's what you're debating, that's what's so pathetic. Runner from Pondok Gede Bekasi. Thank you PSN, thank you Hayfish, thank you semua band. Okay, to all the audiences, please enter the breakout room. To all of the audiences, please go to the breakout room. You can choose which breakout room you want to enter. Thank you very much. Mm. Once again to all of the audiences, please enter the breakout room. Thank you very much. You can click more beside the reaction, then go in the breakout room to Mrs. Teddy. You are welcome. Once again, to all of the audiences, please go to the breakout room. You can choose which breakout room do you want to enter. You can click more, then join the breakout room. Or you can tell us which Breakout room, do you want to enter? Type it on the chat section. Beside the reaction, so Mr. is there beside the reaction. There is a reaction beside the reaction. There is more than click it and join the breakout room. If you using computer or laptop. Okay, just tell us which breakout room do you want to enter? Yes, wait for a minute. Be patient to all of the audiences.
Sorry, I can't find more. Uh, next. I only have reactions, nothing next to it. I would like to go to breakout room A. Yes, we will, we will add you to the breakout room. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. You too. Me too, sir. Yes, sir, wait for a minute. We will add you to the breakout room. Just tell us which breakout room do you want to enter? Do you want to enter A or B? Type it on the chat section. Thank you very much. Uh, and then followed up by a question and answer session. So I'll put um, a timer on just to be precise on 20 minutes and we'll have the rest of the time for the question and answer. Um, so my, my title would be, uh, um, as a disclaimer, uh, this is quite awkward as a moderator, I have to explain about me. Um, I'm not from the social science and anthropological um, um, research area, I would say. Um, my background would be more on environmental um, science which is climate change, uh, marine realm, um, talking about the conservation issue, as I am now also working with a conservation organization called Conservation International, um, looking at uh, blue carbon projects um, in Asia Pacific region. Um, but at the same time, I also play in a band that will perform towards the end, Somagora, um, with that will be um, the uh, guinea pig for this short um, research that I, that I could uh, produce for PSN. Um, so going towards the, the narrative, I guess the punk and climate movement uh, similarities, um, shout out to Elise if, if she's in the room on, on her movement on climate and with the Extension Rebellion um, as well in Australia. I guess the idea is, is to, um, the similarities to see the movement both movement against oppression or business as usual, we may, we may say. In the punk scene, it's pretty much oppressing the government, um, um, the, the situational um, condition uh, in each country. Whereas in climate, it's pretty much, we're having this subculture, um, subcultural movement basically to kind of shift the paradigm from an extractive point of view into a more conservation and sustainable living, um, climate friendly kind of stuff. Um, uh, the both both punk and climate movement has voiced out a specific message, uh, which we have equality. You have the SDG. You have 17 points of sustainable development goals within the climate that would ensure um, equality and equity um, among communities, as well as in the policy. Okay. So um, I, I also point out that both punk and climate movement would have that quote unquote ignorance or don't care attitude toward ex existing implementing um, system, such as the, the governance or the government. Um, even hearing the song murder the government from no effects kind of kind of spark um, us, the climate researcher to kind of tell government what to do instead of just opening our hands and accepting that um, fossil fuels is no longer being accepted within the climate um, um, community. And also both um, a movement, um, punk movement and climate movement, we see having that strong camaraderie among members. So, so we look after each other um, within the climate activism as well as the punk um, rock scene. So this is just a, a narrative um, um, of the idea uh, that I personally use both in my work within the climate activism to kind of shout out whether this is not a, a, a business as usual that we need to accept and we need a change there. But also I kind of use that in, in, in my band called Somagora, which we kind of use uh, climate awareness um, um, within our lyrics as, as a vehicle to kind of promote climate awareness um, towards everyone. So this is, this is a super simple research. I, I wouldn't say this is a, a, a complicated one. Um, the method is pretty much um, giving questionnaires, simple questions um, to our Instagram connections, uh, 
by six, uh, 90, 90 persons, 90 respondents. And using um, Somagora's own um, origin of crisis, uh, we call it the, the EP, consists of four songs. Um, and we're using that, Alice would say, the defeatism kind of lyrics uh, within our, our music. Just a short glimpse, um, The Last King of the North, the song would talk about um, the, uh, what you call it, the, the North King, the polar bear that is pretty much affected much uh, with the climate change and the poles both being the kingdom that kind of protects the environment from um, um, catastrophe, basically. Sea rise is really uh, um, self-explanatory. That's the, 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 the threat that we would really see if we do nothing uh, in terms of climate. Closer, we use a happy vibe with, within the song, like a folk kind of song, but with a kind of depressed lyrics that our future generation will pretty much blame us um, in terms of the sins that we are doing today. And Cat Conspiracy is pretty much talking about social injustice. So, so we're using this kind of song um, to our um, audience and to, we really want to see whether it's kind of effective of, of having that climate movement as well. So the, the questionnaire is conducted um, less than a month. It's, it's, a, it's a really short one with quite simple question. Have you heard about the EP? Um, what kind of aspect um, does, the, does the participants um, hear, uh, like the music composition, or is it more on the lyrics, or even a particular instruments, we get that as well, um, or both, and how aware of you with the environment climate change issue. So from the respondent, we have quite a diverse uh, respondent. We have musicians, um, we have climate researchers as well, and um, above both, both too. So how effective do you see um, uh, music as a vehicle to spread message and awareness? Uh, this is also part of the question. And how much lyrics affect your opinion? So this is pretty much, we want to scope out whether if you have quite a good music with lyrics such as love and candy and love and candy, would that be uh, a good band that you will follow or just a simple music, but with really deep lyrics in it? So we want to really want to scope that out. Um, male, female, um, we, we try our best to keep, keep gender balance, but unfortunately we have more males <laughs> towards this music. Um, age criteria, we have um, pretty much in the 30s, um, early and late. Uh, like I said before, the occupation, you have musicians, um, you have climate researchers and, and um, both, both too. And then the location is pretty much Jakarta and outside Jakarta as well. So it's pretty straightforward research, like I said before. So we have no's um, as well, just to have that uh, clarity on, on the bias within the, the answers. And the aspect is pretty much, it's, it's, we could really see that both music and lyrics play a big part um, in terms of favorable from the participants. So not only music and not only lyrics, we need to combine that too, in order to have that um, effect towards uh, what we want to uh, move upon. So from the climate awareness, we have both moderate and fully aware. This is, this is I would assume this is coming from the climate researcher on the fully aware um, respondents um, and others are moderate. Um, how effective? Um, they would really say yes on the effectiveness of using lyrics as part of um, sending message um, within a music or within a band. And they would also say yes, that affects the opinion on following a particular band. So just to keep it short, um, key takeaways from the, from the survey, um, respondent occupation sample represent three main audience equally um, from research realm, musician um, within the same scene and others that represent layman and global communities. People also tend to be attracted by both music and lyrics, um, although more, more people looks more into lyrics than music. People find it effective to use lyrics in the music to spread message and awareness. This one is the avenue of riding waves of the scene spread climate awareness. So again, going back to the first slide, using this movement, using this rage and anger between both, it's gonna kind of have that connectivity uh, of the audience. And more than half of the sample do agree that lyrics does affect how they perceive one band to another. So I'm keeping this short to just to keep time for discussion and um, um, other uh, speakers. One, one lyrics that I, that I clipped from 
from my old man. It's pretty much go take your cash and be prepared. There's nothing much that we can do because earth will die and thanks to you. So this kind of stuff, you, you'll see much um, from the lyrics though. So check it out. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Um, so uh, if, if I may, uh, we keep all the presentation for the sake of time, um, three presenters, and then keep the question and answer at the end. So while um, Herman, um, you wanna share your screen, I'll read um, Herman's um, um, resume. So we have Herman Tolanel from Leiden uh, in 1978, founded PIN, uh, then the only du Dutch punk fanzine not from Amsterdam. Also in 1978, he was a co-author of Rock Against Racism in the Netherlands. In 1980 to 1982, he was in the band Cheap and Nasty, uh, male half of lead vocals, toy saxophone, a band praised by avant-gardist Dutch Vinyl Magazine and British Sounds Weekly. He became a PhD who wrote his dissertation on Indonesian and Indian history. Um, he was in charge of the art history department of Leiden University uh, Library Catalog. So Herman, without further ado, um, the time is yours. Thank you. I, I, um, I will... Uh... Hello, everyone. Slamat sore for you. Slamat pagi for me. Assalamu alaikum. Our conference theme is global punk. Today, punks and others face a global climate crisis, as my predecessor said. And. Um, and the global corona crisis. New Zealand deals relatively well with that crisis, as they have Dr. Susie Wiles, and she spells her name like this. Uh, Dr. Susie Wiles has pink hair. Women with pink hair are better at fighting COVID than the man in the White House in Washington with orange hair. My subject is Indonesian punk contributions to the 1977 to till 1981 first European punk wave. So how about influence from Indonesia went global? In the Dutch 1950s, there were so-called Indo-Rock musicians of mixed Indonesian-European ancestry called Eurasian, Indies, Dutch, Indo. Later came Indo-Punks. What did these two have in common? What were differences between them? How about the Kronjong guitar tradition, where Indo musicians in all Indo bands or in mixed national origin bands was participation by, by women the same in 1955 as in 1980? What were the Dutch punk scenes like in which Indo punks participated? We may learn something for today from answering these questions. And, and here I have a photo. It, uh, it shows uh, on the, uh, the here our drummer who is of uh, partially Indonesian ancestry. And then there is the bass player and the female vocalist uh, uh, who wrote the songs on our EP. She is present today, by the way. Uh, and then uh, the, the I am, uh, should also be on the photo. Okay, yes. Uh, the photo shows my band, Cheap and Nasty, in 1980. On the background, you, you could see the logo of Crest, the English band. We were the support band. Uh, 
and uh, I would uh, should uh, tell about our bass player. She became an engineer degree in architecture, like President Sukarno of Indonesia. Uh, and our drummer was not the only person in the early Dutch punk scene of partly Indonesian ancestry. Rock, punk have never been exclusively white and never exclusively male. Let us look now at the people of mixed Indonesian Dutch ancestry, then at the role of these Eurasians in 50s rock in the Netherlands, and then their role in punk since the late 1970s. Indies Dutch have a long history in Indonesia and in the Netherlands. Often they faced discriminations. In the 1930s, a Dutch Nazi weekly called them brown monkey scum. It praised violence against them. After 1945, many Indies Dutch went to the Netherlands to escape the fighting between Dutch and Indonesian armies. They faced prejudices in the Netherlands, like happened to the father of the drummer of my band. Then, before punk, there was 1950s rock. Eurasians started Dutch 50s rock and roll. A softer version of that so-called Indo-rock was called Indo-pop of people like the Blue Diamonds and Anneke Grönlo. In Indonesia, Eurasians had a long tradition of playing acoustic guitars in Kronjong music, a continuation of centuries ago when Portuguese had first brought guitars to Indonesia. Hawaiian uh, steel guitar music also influenced Indonesia. These acoustic guitars were stepping stones to electric rock guitars, giving Indos an advantage in the Netherlands. In the 1950s, many autochthonous Dutch people still saw guitars as foreign instruments from far away Portugal or still further away Indonesia or Hawaii. So far, guitars, acoustic, electrical, had not played big roles in Dutch music. But then came the Indies Dutch, establishing a guitar history line from European Portugal and Spain to Asian Indonesia and Pacific Hawaii, back to another European country, the Netherlands. After the rock and roll 50s, the hippie subculture arose in the 60s. There were there was then 1% unemployment in the Netherlands. Unemployment rose during the 1970s to 15% in 1984. For young people, 27%. Three movements then might have attracted young people. They failed. These three movements were one, social democrat politics, two, the hippie subculture, and three, second wave feminism. Why were these three movements unattractive to many young people as unemployment rose? First, social democrat politics. About 1975, the British Labour Party and its Dutch sister party were in government, but they switched to international monetary fund style austerity policies, which made unemployment worse and diminished the attractiveness of these political parties to young people. And then second, hippie subculture. After arising in the 60s, in the 70s, it had spawned an elite of rich rock stars playing in stadiums with fans lying on the ground passively. In the 60s, there had been a slogan, never trust anyone over 30. 
in the 70s, the hippies had become over 30. They often decided which bands could play or could not play at venues. They often said, no punk music. Punks reacted with, never trust a hippie. The third movement was Dutch second wave feminism, also arisen during the 1960s. Its original slogan was, all women are sisters. In the 70s, some dogmatic feminists said, all women are sisters, except young women with mini skirts or purple hair. That attitude made many women-only spaces unattractive to young women. So many of them closed down in the 1980s. In different economic, social and political times, different subcultures arise. So time for a new subculture, more suited to harsh times than hippie, time for punk. Before punk started in the Netherlands, it started in France. It started with the band called The Loose. The Loose were three French girls and Eurasian Dutch drummer and co-songwriter Saskia de Jong, also the first all-women rock band in any genre in France. Still, the Wikipedia article, Women in Punk Rock, omits the loose. The Wikipedia article, French Punk, names the loose only fleetingly. The loose became support band to well-known the Clash in Britain. American Richard Hell was the other support act on that tour. People said the Loose blew Richard Hell off stage. The Loose were the only band asked to play on both days of the French Mont de Marsan 1977 punk festival. Why have the Loose been largely written out of history? The Loose and Indonesian Dutch punk musicians in the Netherlands faced two obstacles in getting well known. One, music establishment resistance against punk. Two, Anglo-American emphasis by authors, which might cause neglect of bands from France or the Netherlands. And the Loose and Dutch Eurasian women faced a third obstacle, resistance against women encroaching on so far male territory. That encroaching was easier in punk than in earlier music genres. For example, established Dutch rock paper or wrote on the 1977 Mont de Marsan punk festival, their sexist and classist review called the loose criminal slum girls. And the only good things about their music was supposedly that it stopped. I was so angry about that review of the loose that I decided to start a punk fanzine and a punk band. English Fifth Albert a teen before punk wanted a role in music. What role? The only role she could imagine then was becoming a groupie. The Loose spoke up about women in music. Carolyn Kuhn interviewed them. They said groupies should become musicians. After punk started, Fifth Albertine had become guitarist of mixed gender band Flowers of Romance with Sid Vicious and of all women, the slits. Saskia de Jong moved to London where she played concerts for racism. In 1981, she started the Miami Beach Girls Band. 
in her and my city Leiden in the Netherlands. Now, in what ways did punk differ from 50s, 60s rock for Indies, Dutch people? 50s Indo rock had been has been relatively well documented, better than what I call Indo punk. The role of Eurasian Dutch people in punk has been underestimated. That is one example of more gaps in historiography of punk in the Netherlands. For example, a well-known book on punk in the Netherlands in 1977 till 1982 interviewed 30 people, including one woman. So supposedly only 3% of Dutch punks were women. Nonsense. The book does have a photo of a woman on the cover. The maxim, little girls should be seen, not heard, is ridiculed by the band X-Ray Specs in their song, Oh Bonded, uh, Pures. This book did not mention Indies Dutch people at all. 1970s, 80s Indo punks had in common with 50s Indo rockers their greater familiarity with guitars, with roots in the Kronkjong tradition. They differed in two ways from the 50s one, more women, and two, Indo punks in the 70s, 80s were more integrated in the punk scene than 50s Indo rockers had been integrated in the Dutch music scene then. One, uh, one can see these two points in subtracts. In 1980, the youngest punk band in the world, younger than Eater in London, subtracts were four 12 to 13 year old girls. National Radio interviewed them. Only one of them, Indy Stutch, Siska, knew how to play an instrument, guitar. Like with 50s Indo rock, the Kronjong musical tradition where people learned to play guitar early helped her. Siska's bandmates were not just another Indie Dutch girl, but also a Belanda Asli, autochthonous Dutch girl, and an Algerian girl. This picture, three national origins in one band, differs from the account by Dutch scholar Berkers. Berkers wrote that all 18 Dutch women punk musicians whom he interviewed were white. He also said they were mostly middle class. However, the subtract bass player Marion was the daughter of a blue collar worker. She half jokingly told, told subtract singer Julia, we are all working class, except you. You are a capitalist kid, so not a real punk. The singer's parents were middle class, not really capitalist. Subtrax was one of at least five punk bands in Leiden City with Eurasian participation. Two of these were all women bands. One was mixed gender, my band, yes. In Leidendorp village next to Leiden, there was an indie Dutch punk bass player. In Leiden lived far less people and far less Eurasian people than in The Hague. So research about The Hague might discover even more punk bands with indie Dutch participation than Leiden. Also, other Dutch cities. In Rotterdam, two girls of mixed Indonesian Dutch ancestry founded the band together with an autochthonous Dutch girl. They called the band the Krupuks after the Indonesian food item Krupuk. A 15 year old Indies Dutch girl became the bass player of Amsterdam punk band The Bugs. Molukken punks 
came to concerts in Paradiso in Amsterdam. What were the differences between 50s, 60s, so-called Indo rock or pop, and 1977 till 81, punks of Eurasian ancestry? I note two differences. First, it looks like 70s Eurasian punks were more integrated in the punk scene than 50s Indo musicians had been in Dutch music then. In the 50s, bands were more often all white or all Eurasian, but in the 70s, 80s, punk bands often contained two or three different ancestral nationalities. Why that difference? Some 50s Indo rock bands, like the Tilman Brothers, had already been founded in Indonesia. Other immigrants had then arrived in the Netherlands recently. They did not know many non-Indo people yet and stuck together. And the 50s anti-immigrant atmosphere worked against forming mixed national origin bands, while many of the 70s, 80s Indo punks were teenagers born in the Netherlands. The second difference with the 1950s is the bigger share of Eurasian punk women in roles other than backing or lead vocals. Women, if participating at all, were usually limited to vocals in pre-1977 popular music. Indo-pop singer Anneke Grönlo was a big star. She continued the female vocalist tradition in Kronjong. But Miss Grönlo was supposed to sing songs written by men, not by herself, not by non-existent female fellow band members. Now, my last words. The late Kurt Cobain of the band Nirvana said, women will save rock. We should hope that women will save punk in the country of Raden Atjen Kartini, Indonesia, in the Netherlands, everywhere. Merdeka, thank you all for listening. Klaus, thank you very much, Herman, um, for, the, for the presentation. I mean, like, it's really interesting to see and to, to learn about the history of the music in Indonesia as well, because from various sources we heard, like, the three times four of worlds come from the Dutch, whereas for Indonesia, the four times four come from the Malay. And we all know like punks pretty much using that four times four that come from the Malay. So, so it's really good to know and to, to be aware of, of the origin of, of the music. And you did also mention a lot about the, the age this discrimination, uh, mentioned about the feminism that is also a big narrative within the history. So. So we'll come back to question and answer for everyone to have that have questions for Herman and perhaps myself, please do jot down to, to what a paper and allow me to go to the third um, speaker um, and, and allow me to also read um, his resume. So Manungal Kawardaya uh, is a heavy metal enthusiast and human rights lecturer from the Faculty of Law, Universitas Jenderal Sudirman Kuo Purwokerto, Central Java, Indonesia. Manungal completed his bachelor degree in law in 1998. After graduation, he worked as a journalist in a local newspaper reporting regularly on politics and culture. In 2005, Manungal gained his master's degree in international and comparative law from Monash University Law School, Melbourne. Manungal returned back as a lecturer to his alma mater, Universitas General Sudirman in 2006 and teach subjects such as Indonesian constitutional law, human rights law, and media law. In 2012, Manungal started his PhD study at the Radboud Universiteit Nijmegen. He focuses his research on human rights issues, especially gross violation of human rights related to the 1965 violence in Indonesia. He is expected to complete his doctoral degree by the end of 2020. So without further ado, uh, Manungal, the, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, Barakala, uh, for the time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Indonesia is now uh, 
3 and 15 p.m. Uh, my paper is entitled The Mainstreaming of the Alternative Narratives of the 1965 Events in the Indonesian Middle East. Uh, my name is Manunggal Kusmawardaya, and as uh, moderator has introduced me, uh, I'm actually a, a lecturer, uh, Faculty of Law, so not Faculty of Music, etc. And before I uh, present my uh, paper or my research, this is my previous research on the issues mostly about 1965 events or uh, past gross violations of human rights. Yeah, so my PhD thesis also about the uh, defense. It should be defended uh, by the end of this year, but uh, I think in, uh, next January or February, hopefully, in uh, Rabat uh, Um Okay, why this research? Actually, um, I have personal interest in uh, human rights uh, uh, subject that I uh, involved in uh, for the last maybe 20 years as a university lecturer uh, as a student also in the 90s and um, also I'm uh, I'm a metal uh, lover uh, metal head like that that's uh, very personal but I, I found the conjunction between the two uh, in this uh, research paper. Okay, I will start uh, with the year of 1965. In Jakarta, uh, on October 1, 1965, several generals were kidnapped uh, and killed by a presidential guard named Chakra Birawa. Uh, several hours later, the commander of the Chakra Birawa, the presidential guard, took the microphone at the uh, national radio announcing the establishment of a Revolutionary Council or Dewan Revolusi, which led by General Untung, uh, Lieutenant, General, Lieutenant Colonel Untung. On the picture is Untung, uh, commander of the uh, presidential guard. And Untung also announced the uh, dissolutions of the cabinet. So it was um, a coup. Around three days later, the bodies of the generals were found in an old well uh, near the uh, air base, which is located uh, not far from the air base, from the air force, Indonesian air force jurisdiction, like that. And what happened? Major General Suharto, uh, who were not targeted by the uh, the kidnappers, took uh, took over control of the army, and he um, uh, crushed the movement, the Gerakan 30 September, and accused the, the, the PKI, the Indonesian Communist Party, as uh, master uh, as the mastermind of the, the the killings and the assassinations of the generals. And uh, since then, uh, Indonesia have uh, official narratives of the uh, what happened on one October, or uh, what uh, what happened in nineteen sixty five in general. The PKI as the sole mastermind of the assassinations, they perpetuate, perpetuated through movies, tattoos, etc. When I was uh, young, when I was like eight or nine years old, we were mobilized by teachers, by schools to go to cinemas to see the movies uh, that you see now on the screen. That's the, the official versions of the, uh, the state concerning uh, 1965 that several generals were killed by a presidential guard and the presidential guard was infiltrated by the PKI. And the narrative uh, continued with uh, the dissolution, the disbandment of the PKI some like Five months later, in 1966, using a letter from Sukarno, uh, famously known by Indonesian people 
as super semar or surat perintah 11 malam. And the People's Consultative Assembly, the highest state organ, removed Sukarno from uh, presidency and appointed Suharto as president in 1967. So that was the beginning of the new order, uh, a regime uh, led by General Suharto, the new order regime. And as you might have known that Suharto was toppled, was overthrown in 1998, some 22 years later, uh, 22 years uh, ago by students' demonstrations uh, amid the uh, economic crisis that hit the region. Now, <clears throat> that's uh, what I just said to you was, what Indonesians uh, know about 1965. Most Indonesians know that several generals killed, kidnapped by the, uh, um, the military from the police, uh, presidential guard, and that the army led by Suharto crushed the movement, and then Indonesia entering a new phase, a new phase, new states, that's all. But there is a dark side of the history that never been told to Indonesian people, never taught at schools, including me, of course. So I left this uh, page blank. It's dark. What happened was according to the National Commission of Human Rights, uh, was crimes against humanity, serious crimes in, uh, according to international law. Mass murder in various places in Java, in Bali, in Satanggara, and also Sumatra. Uh, the death toll of between 500,000 to 1 million people. Okay. Thousands imprisoned, raped, and tortured. So thousands of people also lost their citizenship and live in exile up to these days. And what happened to this case after the fall of Suharto? This is what happened. 55 years after 1965, and more than two decades after Suharto, the case has not been resolved. In 2012, the National Commission of Human Rights issued or published an executive summary of the report concerning past gross violations of human rights, including the 1965-1966 events. The investigation uh, should be followed by the Attorney General Office under uh, the government or under the president. But until today, until we gather in this forum, there's no investigation carried out by the AGO or uh, Attorney General Office. Also, no change in historical narratives. Despite various findings from academic uh, research or academic investigations, one of the earliest research on who was behind the killings of the journals conducted by Benedict Anderson and Ruth McVeigh uh, from the US. They concluded that the PKI was not alone, was not the sole actor. It was an internal conflict of the army. Another version said that Sukarno was behind the killings. Another version said that Suharto was behind the case. And a more recent development shows that the CIA was behind the mass murder. Because Indonesia was at that time the third largest communist uh, country after Soviet Union and China. And 
it was considered as dangerous uh, to the region. That's why the uh, the U.S. backed the Indonesian military to uh, do a communist purge. And Aldo Suharto considered as human rights violators, corruption, involved in nepotism, cronyism, and responsible for many, at least uh, around uh, 10 gross violations of human rights. But the successor government, including today's government, still maintain the, uh, the narratives of the new order. It's only said, it's, it states that uh, the PKI was behind the killings of the generals and they were uh, disbanded by Suharto, that's all. This uh, like the situation in injustice. The victims, they don't get uh, what they deserve. Reparations, compensations, acknowledgement as victims. Yeah, even as uh, the government never asks for witness to the victims. 22 years after Suharto. So the situation led to what's in the human rights studies called as impunity. A situation where the perpetrators of past human rights abuse escape the uh, you know punishment. Now, uh, amid this uh, that terrible situations, uh, at least three uh, Indonesian metal bands that bring the dim, the the the, the non-mainstream. Narratives of 1960 back into their songs. At least three bands that I can identify. The first is Absolute Defiance with their song entitled Kaleidoscope of Bantayan or Kaleidoscope uh, of Slaughter. Siksa Kubur with their song uh, Sumpah Berbisik Part One and Sumpah Berbisik Part Two. Uh, what you call it in uh, English? So, Whispering uh, promises, maybe. Sumpah berbisik, and seringai, yeah, uh, with their song entitled "Enam Lima" or "65" in 2018. So uh, that's the three bands that uh, I will study. Uh, I will scrutinize uh, to this research. My questions uh, are three: the ground motives of the uh, the song. Uh, micro of uh, to uh, bring the theme into their songs, their intentions, and what's the, their expectation uh, for that. Uh, my research is also research, uh, qualitative, so data collected through interviews. I interviewed the, uh, I interviewed the band members, uh, and it's uh, using a narrative research approach. Uh, I'm going to talk about absolute defiance now. Uh, this is one of the earliest uh, death metal, Indonesian death metal bands that uh, issued or produced their uh, records in early 2000. At the time, uh, of course, cannot be compared with today's technology, still analog. And, um, but they uh, managed to release one of the uh, most uh, uh, famous uh, recordings in that metal skin, Absolute Defiance. Previously, they used the name uh, Fire, but they changed the name to Absolute Defiance because uh, a US band uh, has uh, used the, the name. And Absolute Defiance, in their songs, the Kaleidoscope Mbantayan, the lyrics of the song do not explicitly mention about uh, political or crimes or explicitly state about 1965-1960 events. But uh, it can be concluded from the, uh, from the, uh, the lyrics, as you can read, yeah, 
jutaan orang dijadikan kami hitam. Millions of people became scapegoat. So it, it has um, it can be connected to the uh, the accusations of the old regime, the, the new new order regime, who accused the PKI as behind the uh, the um, the killings of the generals and can the justifications of the regime to kill them because they were deemed they were perceived to be members or sympathizers of the PKI and also the lyric dan dibantai secara massal sampai habis it was slaughter until no one left more or less that's the English translation I only put uh, two uh, lyrics yeah Actually, in my uh, full paper, I uh, analyzed more. And Bimo Samya Yogi, the uh, guitarist and the lyricist of the, the song, told me that he was inspired by many references that he read when he was uh, in high school. And he learned that uh, so many things different from what he got. At school, the school didn't told him, didn't taught, teach him about the killings, about the mass murders of ordinary civilians. The school didn't teach him about concentration camp in Buru Island. The school didn't teach him about what you call it. Uh, the loss of citizenship of many Indonesians abroad at the time because they uh, were considered as Sukarno loyalists, loyalists of the Sukarno, and so on and so on and so on. So Bimo said to me that I began to realize that there were injustice which has no place in the official history of the nation. And he said that I wanted this history to be known by my generation. Yeah, the dark page of the history. That's uh, uh, more or less what I got from uh, absolute defiance uh, represented by Bimo. And then we proceed to Siksa Kubur. Siksa Kubur is uh, probably one of the uh, most respected bands, uh, death metal bands or metal bands in Indonesia today. They have released uh, eight studio albums, if I'm not mistaken, um, and listed as one of the best Indonesian bands by a uh, famous magazine, uh, Metal Hammer. Uh, they um, open for several foreign uh, metal acts in Indonesia. And um, yeah, they have uh, survived the skin for more than or nearly two decades. Yeah. So uh, it's a special man. Um, the lyrics of the song, yeah. Sumpah Berfisik, part one and two, Andre Tiranda, told me that the song uh, was inspired by a movie uh, directed by Joshua Oppenheimer entitled The Egg of Killing. But um, the movie was about a killer. Sorry, the song was about a killer who haunted uh, persons uh, he perceived to be sinners or uh, um, what you call it, those who are bad or um, even subhuman. Even considered as subhuman, so doesn't have the right to live. So Andre Tiranda told me that Sumbah Rupisik songs about 1965, yet from of the perpetrators, which is uh, Anwar Kongo, one of the character of the the movie, The Act of Killing. Anwar Kongo in the movie, if you you've seen the the, the documentary proudly told the director uh, how he killed people deemed to be 
PKI members or Chinese people. He told, he explained yeah, the techniques that he used in killing people proudly. That's uh, what. Uh, that's why Andre interested to uh, Anwar. So he actually wrote about the killing uh, a killer in 1965. What's the uh, interesting? What interested him most was that Anwar thought that he was a patriot. So he concluded that Anwar was also a victim of uh, state propaganda in 1965. When you are willing to kill other people because of, you know, the propaganda. And interestingly, yeah, Andre himself is part of victim's family. His father was imprisoned by the regime, by New York regime for nine and a half years without trial. Andre's father was not a member of the PKI, but uh, was a Sukarnois, one of the uh, as you call it, um, top leaders in uh, student uh, organizations under Sukar, under uh, Partai Nasional Indonesia, the Indonesian National Party, which was affiliated uh, with Sukarno. And Andre told me that he realized that the song that he wrote. Uh, can be an entry point for the listeners to learn further about the, the events. Although initially he was only interested to bring the awkwardness of Anwar Kongo, the, the cold-blooded uh, Anwar Kongo into the songs. And he thought that it suits with the theme, with the, with the genre of uh, his band, uh, Siksakubur with uh, uh, play death metal. Uh, the last is Seringai, yeah, uh, with a song entitled Nam Lima. Nam Lima, as I told you before, in Indonesia means 65, referring to the year six, 1965. Seringai, Seringai is not uh, unlike uh, absolute defiance and Siksakubur, Seringa is more into thrust metal. And they um, have released uh, at least three studio albums, if I'm not mistaken. And they also uh, have a large audience throughout the nations. They opened for Metallica several years ago. And also uh, another uh, big ex from outside Indonesia. They also toured uh, Japan recently. And uh, Arian, the lead singer or vocalist of the band, Arian uh, Arifin, or popularly or famously known as Arian 13, Arian uh, said that uh, he has a personal background also with the 1965-66 events. Uh, his grandmother was in prison also for 13 years because uh, her grandma, uh, his grandmother, was a member of LECRA or um, Lembaga Kebudayaan Rakyat, a People's Culture Institution, more or less, the translation. And the LECRA uh, was deemed by the new order government as affiliated with the PKI. Yeah, I, um, and because of that, Aryan's grandmother served 13 years in jail without uh, trial. Uh, and um, he told me also, similar to uh, what Bimo from absolute defiance told me what Andre Tiranda told me about. 
the official narrative that he read that he learned when he was when he was young when he was uh, a little boy and uh, when he became when he uh, grew up in high schools and at the college he started to learn he started to find another source that gives him more about 1965 and at that time, his parents told the truth about his grandmother. They uh, made the story secret to him because they were afraid that their life will be difficult. will be in trouble if people know that uh, they are part of uh, of political groups or uh, political organization that seem to be enemy by the uh, the authority of the state. Um, apologies, Mas Manungal. Uh, can we have two more minutes? Uh, yeah, we'll uh, be I'll be closing you. the uh, presentation soon. The song alone was not enough to tell anything about the 1965 events, but I hope that the newer generation will find the information themselves about the characters of past and of uh, our history. That's what Aryan hoped with that song. In conclusion, uh, all of the musicians share similar experience with the official dominant narrative of the 65. Two of them, even uh, part of victims, victims' families. And the musicians chose to bring local domestic issues in their music, which is uh, 1965 events, cross violations of human rights. And all the musicians saw that the need to uh, uncover the history as part of the enjoyment of freedom of expression. And the songs are part of uh, memorializations in approaching human rights, which refuse to, to forget the dark past. Yeah. And by keeping the memory of the events, the musicians contribute to the achievement of justice for the 1965-66 events. Thank you, moderator. I return the time. Uh, Thank you very much, Mas um, Manungal, uh, for the presentation. It's it's super important, I guess, the, the narrative that we don't want to forget our dark history uh, and that to become a fuel of few of the lyrics and the movements, actually, for subculture. So we still have around 15 minutes-ish uh, for question and answer. Um, I would strongly suggest for people to turn on their video and their mic because during this pandemic and virtual times, uh, we don't see faces. So if you want to ask a question, please do um, address the question to who. And uh, if you um, can open your video in mind, please, please do so. so. OK. Can I? Sarva, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Pardon? Hello? Yes. Can you hear my voice? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now I have okay. a question, if you don't mind. Uh, two questions, if you don't mind. The first is uh, for you, because mm -hmm. you're talking about environmental air. Uh, in Indonesia, do we have a punk movement that uh, fight for the environment? Uh, since you, with your uh, Somagora, talking about climate change, and Superman is dead, uh, talking about against reclamation in Bali. And then, if you know Racun Timur, a ska punk band from Bali also, like Superman, Superman is dead, uh, talking about environment too. Do you know if there is an Indonesian punk movement uh, that talk, fight for environment? That's my first question. And my second question. Uh, this event called Punk Scholar Network, isn't it? Uh, in the first session with uh, uh, first speakers, I talk about uh, one phenomena in Indonesia, yeah? in coastal area of Java Island, in uh, Tegal to Pekalongan, Cirebon, and etc. Uh, we have here 
uh, phenomena it's like uh, children in the age of 9 to 20 who called themselves punker and then uh, and they are very very young underage and then uh, careless nothing useless because they don't know what to do they don't know what they're doing you know like uh, maybe in our uh, teenager age uh, bara we, we i think we know what we are we want to do isn't it uh, so when we are grow up uh, we know we want to uh, we want to well educate ourselves it's like you maybe you have a master degree or everyone has a doctor degree or everything uh, so we can be heard government want to hear us everyone want to hear us because uh, we can speak loud and full of content so now with the phenomena how if uh, an educated community want to speak a thing they don't know. So I think in this uh, very cool event, maybe we should talk about that. Because this is a real problem in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Got it. Thank you, Ario, for the question. If, if I may just quickly yes. to kind of uh, give some time for other question as well. Um, regards to the to the movement, I, I, this is as far as I know, um, pretty much it's fragmented uh, across region. Like, like you said before, you said yourself, like in Bali, there's a lot of um, environmental bans because there are a lot of issues there. Whereas in, in, um, in Jakarta, perhaps uh, you have whom human ML is going to uh, um, perform later on. We're talking about impunity, uh, similar with uh, Manungal's presentation on impunity. So I guess it's quite fragmented and it depends on, it's pretty much like a scene, uh, who's know who and you pretty much going to the same scene and, and going towards the same community. As for the second question is, is, is quite deep to be honest. And um, it's pretty much um, um, my own driver for having this, um, um, what you call it, you were mentioning about degree and focusing on environment, but it's the other way around. Um, I'm using my music to kind of voice out the environment issue, but at the same time, I'm using the environmental scene or environmental industry to, kind of, to, to be my, what you call a um, channel in terms of anger or funk and, and, and asking for a change, to be honest. So it's still the same narrative, but it, it would be in a different industry. Yeah. Uh, others, Herman, um, Manungal, if you want to respond to the second question as well, please do. If not, if we could go to the sec next question, if, if there's any. Can I have a question? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, kudos to all of the presenters Yeah, for presenting a very thorough presentation. Well, I have a question for uh, each of the presenter. So for... But uh, do you think that punk music in Indonesia sees environmental issue less less than, let's say, political issue in their lyrics? Well, um, some DIY movements related to environmental matter, such as footnote bomb right now, is not gaining any momentum. So is my thought right? What is the problem about bringing up environmental issue voiced out by punk music in Indonesia? And for Herman, uh, do you think that Dutch colonialism uh, brings any influence to punk movement or music in Dutch colonized countries all over the world. And for uh, Manu, uh, do you think that uh, their lyrics bring an enlightenment about dark history in Indonesia, especially to young listeners? Do they only listen to, let's say, the music or do they study the lyrics as well? Uh, well, lastly, I hope we can still all establish communication and really establish punk scholars network in Indonesia with heterogeneous uh, expertise brought by all individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, avoiding talking too much, um, I guess I would um, give some time to Herman and, or Manungal to respond to the question first. Okay, uh, maybe I can uh, answer first about the, uh, the response of the audience or the listeners of uh, 
the three bands that I uh, discussed before. Uh, I asked uh, Bimo, uh, the, uh, the guitarist of uh, Absolute Defiance, whether um, any response uh, to uh, the song, and also to the to Andre and uh, to Arian. But um, they have uh, uh, they answer that um, relatively the same that uh, maybe uh, people or listener uh, will not have all informations related to the crime. So just only uh, listening by listening to the song. But at least um, by uh, reading the lyrics, by knowing the uh, by knowing the uh, the title and um, especially uh, Arian, he said that he always uh, continue um, mind streaming the uh, Mind streaming the, the the issue of 1965, 1965 uh, uh, every September and October, uh, so that uh, his audience, his fans or the band's fans, uh, will dig the issue by themselves. That's what I uh, that's what I uh, got from the band. So maybe it's not a not no very big impact. We uh, we never know, but uh, by uh, uh, reading the lyrics, uh, by uh, putting the stories, in the lyrics, then um, there is a hope at least. Yeah, um, Herman, you wanna you wanna respond to the question as well? Yes. It is an interesting question. What I have so, uh, studied is mainly the influence from Indonesia to the Netherlands, and I did not study the, any influence the other way around from the Netherlands to Indonesia. I really don't know uh, ab about it. What I do know is about another country uh, which used to be a colony of the Netherlands, Suriname, the, the, uh, in Suriname there are several punk bands, one of them called the Rotten Apples, the Rotten uh, Apples in uh, English, maybe they were inspired by, uh, uh, by punk in the Netherlands, I'm not sure, there were also Suriname, uh, people from Suriname who lived in the Netherlands and who were active in the punk uh, scene, uh, maybe uh, influence went that way, yes. Got it. Um, I guess as, as for my short um, answer would be uh, the, the environment issues and political issues is some, somewhat inseparable. So every time we talk about environmental, it's going back to the political decision, policies and regulation within the government. So I guess both issues, whether environment and politics, we're kind of fighting for the same thing, we're just fighting for the same community. Um, um, yeah, I guess, I guess within Somagora as well, we're not talking about environment, we would talk about social injustice as well. So it's, it's quite um, connected one to another. If, if I can have my, more time, I did promise Elise, if, if you have a question. Sorry, hey, I, I kind of skipped yeah. on Can I have, can I ask? Okay, hello. Can, 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 can you go after Elise? Because she did ask in the chat earlier and then, um, and then you, if that's okay. Oh, okay, okay. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, actually, I feel like maybe this question has already been answered. I just wanted to, yeah, just hear more about whether or not you found any overlap between um, members of the punk community, um, either specifically in the Jakarta area or otherwise, um, overlapping with climate activist groups, um, and whether or not there's been like a like because punk does has tended to be depoliticized in a lot of ways and whether there's been this like repoliticization through these activist causes whether there is overlap that you found with that um within like your own local scene or elsewhere um yeah but i don't know if you maybe already touched on that so uh, up to you how to just give me a brief brief answer on that yeah sure uh, i guess that's a that's an interesting question i'll be super brief at least if i may 
um, the, the keyword would be youth um, for myself. So well, when you talk about um, any kind of environmental movement, you talk about punk, youth would be the fuel, if that makes sense, to kind of, to kind of push forward agendas. Because like, like Manungal did mention about uh, on the presentation that over time, this spirit or this anger or this rage of the movement kind of depletes, if that makes sense, it depends whether you're sitting at the moment. So for example, if, if I'm perhaps a, a, the vice president of the Republic of Indonesia, I would perhaps say more diplomatically rather than government needs to change this and that. So, so youth would be, would be the key and, and, and thanks to your movement as well. Um, one last question, Fahran, if I may. Um, I did promise to Julianus. Yes. Yeah, last question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, my, name is, my name is Febri and I wanna ask Mas Manunggal. So uh, first thing first, uh, thank you for bringing this topic uh, since I, I've i been thinking about that actually and I want to wrote about that, but you have done it. So <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and um, this is in Indonesian metal scene that you found uh, three bands that are using their agency or their, their, their status of the high top top metal bands in Indonesia to 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 wrote, to write about uh, the 65 issues, and I found also in Australia, uh, in Australia there's a band called High Tension. High Tension in 2018 also uh, released their album entitled Perch, and it's it's all about uh, 65. And uh, my question is, uh, how do you see this, uh, this, um, this lyrical, refuse to forget lyrical theme uh, in the context where there is an Australian band that, uh, well, actually the vocalist is from Indonesia and, and there is also a, a high, um, high awareness in those people outside Indonesia that live outside Indonesia to raise about that. And, the second one is uh, to what extent that those uh, those lyric influence the metal head. Uh, I you said it, that uh, that they they just sing it to raise awareness, but to what extent that uh, these songs may influence a movement? Since we talk about a movement in subcultures, uh, uh, is it possible that? This lyrics raise raise awareness and uh, in within the metal community, metal metal scene in Indonesia, there is an um, maybe there is a movement that always talk about this issue because this is an important issue. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yulan. Um, okay, um, concerning the uh, the Australian bands that uh, also bring the issue into their songs. I think that's uh, very interesting, but uh, we can also we understand um, from your um, uh, story just now that uh, the lead singers uh, was an Indonesian. So I think it's, it's part of uh, global solidarity to uh, to bring justice to the, the victims. I remember in uh, 2014 uh, or 13, I know if I'm mistaken, uh, in The Hague in uh, Netherlands, we uh, established or we declared the establishments of the International People's Tribunal in 65. Uh, uh, People's Tribunal to push the government to, uh, to bring justice to the people. And solidarity at the time was not limited to only Indonesians, but uh, people from all over the world. And even the tribunal, the People's Tribunal, even though was not, uh, you know, uh, it isn't, it's not a formal or um, binding uh, court, but it has a high moral uh, force. So I've, if we learn today that uh, the government seems to be ignoring uh, to resolve the case, uh, civil society still have to, you know, uh, never give up to to bring to keep the issues uh, on the surface. That's what the I think that 
most important thing in this. Uh, Please help me. So, uh, main, keep on mainstreaming the the issue. Maybe uh, and, and the, your second question. Maybe uh, will it have uh, a direct impact on the uh, treatment of justice? Well, you uh, cannot expect a big thing uh, uh, will happen suddenly. You need to uh, start from a uh, little. Yeah, by raising awareness, at least you know that uh, something bad happened. And that's not just because uh, uh, our destiny not, not only determined by God, but that's the wrongdoings of the government. By knowing that, by, uh, by understanding that, we will be aware about uh, other human rights violations that potentially hit us. Oh. That's, I think that's the, the, the main core. Whether you will be, or the listeners will be uh, focusing the issue and become advocates or supporters uh, of this case, that's another, uh, another discussion. But the main point is that uh, our awareness will be uh, increased or uh, developed. The yeah. listener. That's, that's uh, the, the main point. Of it. Yeah, it's just like a little piece, pieces of the puzzle. So. Yeah. But you need to have that little puzzle, that tiny puzzle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. so so thanks thanks for all the question. Uh, apologies thank you, for the thank timing. you. Thanks for all the uh, speakers as well. Um, I did put in the chat if people would still have questions, please do contact organizers, and we'll follow back that question to you. And thanks for Punk Scholars Network. I mean, like it's our job to keep punk rock elite. Um, so um, let's go back to the main room and and thanks everyone. See ya. Thank you very much to Mr. Barakala Robin, Mr. Herman, and Mr. Manungal for the presentation. So to all of the audiences, please go back to the main room because we are going to enter the break session and we are going to see the performances by the next victim and Humanimo. And we also have the last quiz session. So this is the last chance to all of you to win free gifts from us. So please go back to the main room. Thank you very much. Once again, to all of the audiences, please go back to the main room. Thank you very much. Please go to the main room to all of the audiences. Thank you very much.